Hello everybody, I'm Nick and today I'm going to show you how you can use protocol buffers in .NET. Protocol buffers are a language-neutral, platform-neutral, extensible mechanism for serializing structured data. It's quite different in terms of how it works, as opposed to something like XML of J or JSON. I'm going to show you how that works. Um, but it's a very efficient and a very fast way of serializing data. It's efficient because it actually doesn't store as much information. And it's also faster because, well, it's not storing as much information, but it also works quite, quite differently in terms of how it is realizing the data. In this video, I'm going to show you how you can use it in your project. And I'm going to use it on an example that's probably something you are using right now, especially if you're using something like Redis. This video is part of my general .NET tutorial series. So if you don't want to miss any episodes, please subscribe and ring the notification bell to get alerted when I upload a new video. So let me show you what I have here. All I have, it's an API that has a single endpoint, the get weather forecast. It accepts a date time, which we only use the date part of. And then it's using a randomized uh, generator to provide you with 10 days worth of forecast from the day you requested it. That's all it really is. Now, because the weather doesn't actually change so frequently and the forecast doesn't change that frequently as well, we're caching that response for one minute because imagine if we had like thousands of people calling this API, you don't want to regenerate that and call APIs to get the forecast every single time. So we're caching it for a short period of time. This caching happens in Redis. I have provided a Docker Compose um, in the description down below alongside this whole project. So you can spin up your own Redis in Docker. With Redis running, I can show you that the cluster is up and alive. And now I can run the project and show you how it functions. So as you can see, I have a single endpoint. And if I click that endpoint, I'm getting the weather back. And if I click it again, the response is very, very fast because we've cached the data. And if I refresh that, you will see that we have one key and this is the JSON body of the response that we are caching. And in a minute, this will be uh, deleted. And as you can see, this is 813 bytes. I don't know if you can see it's a bit blurry, but it's very, very small. It's almost one kilobyte, fairly small. However, we don't actually need to store things like date or temperature or summary. Protocol buffers or protobuf will actually only store the values because you have a contract for how this should be serialized and deserialized. So let me show you how that would work. In my cached weather forecast service, this is where the actual serialization happens. We have uh, the database connection to Redis and we're getting the cached value. And if the cached value doesn't exist, uh, sorry, if the cached value does exist, then we're doing a JSON deserialization using the built-in JSON serializer and we're returning that value. If it doesn't exist, then we're calling the actual service. And if this looks a bit weird to you, um, this is using the scriptor decorate method. I have a video dedicated to that. I'm going to link it in the description down below as well. You can check that to see how that works, injecting the same service within the service. Um, but we're hitting the actual API to get the forecast, then we're storing it in Redis and then we're returning it. So every other time that we call this, the value will be coming from the cache and we won't be calling an API to get it. And the idea behind this is that it's very fast, but we can make it faster and we can make the data that we store smaller by using protocol buffers. The first thing you want to do, you're gonna go to the NuGet package, manage packages, and you wanna find protobuf hyphen net and you wanna add this new package. Normally protocol buffers use their own contract. That looks like this, I'll put it on screen right now. And then you generate your classes out of this. Um, however, we don't need to do that because protobuf net will actually provide you with a lot of C sharp um, attributes to generate that all behind the scenes without even having to worry about it, which is amazing. So for the purpose of simplicity, I'm going to use the same um, contract that I use on the API level for the database level. Um, in a realistic scenario, you might want to separate them, but for now, I'm just going to use the same. So with that imported, the first thing you want to do is you want to use the proto contract attribute on the class level. So that is step one. The second thing you want to do is you want to add the proto member 
on each property and you need a number as well and this number is very important it's called the tag and you need that because like I said before we don't actually store for example date or temperature C or summary in the data that we store we just store the values so protobuf needs this to know that okay first I need to uh, deserialize a date time which is a string in, in protobuf I think then I need to um, deserialize an integer which is an int here and then I need a string again it doesn't know what the name of the string is it just knows the order and that's how it works and you can also have nested things so you could very much um, have a nested object of some type I'm just going to use the same type here uh, forecast and have it as four and then this object internally would also need to be decorated with protocol uh, proto contract and its own proto members and whenever you make any breaking changes well you can't make any breaking changes because they will break the data that you store but whenever you add something you can add it with decorating it with a proto member and provide a tag and then you won't mess up the ordering so in that way that's how protocol buffers will do the serialization without actually storing the name of the property it's very useful so with that out of the way you currently are just simply able to swap out the json stored data with protocol stored data and let me show you how we can do that i'm going to go back to the cached weather forecast and deserialization is a bit easy or easier than serialization so first you want to use the serializer cl class make sure it's coming from protobuf and do deserialize and we're going to delete that and almost there this requires a stream so we will need to convert that cached value we're going to use the redis uh, value which has an implicit operator in a byte array because if i show you what this deserialize method uses it uses a read only memory byte which is translating to a byte array with operators behind the scenes so that's the idea with uh, deserialization now serialization is a bit more complicated because we need to use a stream and or a byte array and we can't simply say serializer dot serialize and then replace that because a serialized method accepts a stream so we're going to convert that weather object to a stream the way we're going to do that is we're going to write a small method here private static byte array of proto c realize of type t and then t record where uh, t is let's say class and then using var stream let me just do this new uh, memory stream did i just say memory steam well that's embarrassing and then you use a serializer class which is what i have here to do serialize on the stream and then the record and this will write the record to the stream and we're returning stream dot to array and now we turn the record into a byte array through a stream and we can use this proto serialize method here to serialize the object and now that's all we need to do to get started it's so simple now i'm going to restart this service i'm going to go back to um protobuf and i'm going to run this endpoint and as you can see returning again and then i'm running it again and again and again and again and again still very fast but in redis we no longer store json we now store something that you cannot read however protobuf can and it's only 280 bytes before we had 813 so it's almost 
one third or one fourth of the size. So your Redis instance that has limited RAM to store data can store three to four times as much data depending on your object by just changing the serializer. So you're making more for the same amount of money. I think that's brilliant. And this just shows you the memory footprint in terms of size. But let's do a quick benchmark. I have one here to see what that would mean um, in terms of uh, performance as well. So if I uncomment all this, what I have here is a benchmark that will instantiate the service and do a JSON serialize and JSON deserialize on the exact same object that we've been using. And then we also have a protobuf serialize and deserialize using the exact same method that I have in the class right now. And I'm going to run this just to show you the results because they're quite impressive. Remember, this will do, well, I totally run the wrong project, but if I select the right one, uh, this will now run a bunch of tests, um, benchmarks to see uh, things like the memory, but we care about the performance because we know it's smaller for ProtoBuff already by checking Redis. And it will show you how much time you spend in these operations. And you might say, well, we're talking microseconds, so it doesn't make much of a difference. But when you have thousands of requests coming in, you're using less data uh, in your storage, but you also are executing things faster and it just adds up. And again, this is just one use case of the scenario. So you might find other use cases. And as you can see, it's 17 microseconds for JSON and five microseconds for Protobuf, which is, again, one third the speed. I'd say this is quite significant, even though we're talking about these small um, numbers, you're gaining something. And I think the biggest performance personally is the actual storage gain, not so much the speed gain, but understanding how this works, seeing how you can use it yourself in your projects, and also using that video as a segue to GRPC, which is something we're going to talk about in future videos. I think this is a perfectly valid use case for something to uh, for something like this. You'll find all this code in the description down below. Please download and play around with it. There's so much you can do with protocol buffers. This is just scratching the surface and it's meant to be an introduction. That's all I had for you for today. Thank you very much for watching. A special thanks to my GitHub sponsors for making these videos possible. If you want to support me as well, you're going to find a link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe for more content like this and ring the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.